Ah. Uh, my own bill? Huh. Kids are dismissed. Wow. That's a blessing, y'all. Not, not just because it's our, my, our kids. But <laughs> it's just so touching. Um, when you hear those words, those lyrics, uh, sung by a, a child, there's some... There's something that, that you just have to remind yourself that you too are a child of God. You know, and, and she's singing about going through a storm. It was a joke earlier. Uh, what eight year old has been through a storm? <laughs> I know, there's not. <laughs> she is going through a very restrictive diet right now. No, no gluten, no sugar, no dairy. So that's a storm for an eight year old. <laughs> She's amazing, um, and Isaac is too. Uh, oh, give me a second. Let me open this. Wow. Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, I do want to honor our our lovely friends Daniel and April Townsley. <laughs> <laughs> Got friends that come and will amen you, and others might not. <laughs> we pay them to amen. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right, well, let's, let's get started. Let me open this up in prayer. Wow, God, just thank you for this morning and, and give us the, the humility as we approach your word. Uh, it's, it's not with man's wisdom alone uh, that we interpret it, but it's by your Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you, unfold the mysteries uh, reveal to each one of us what we need to receive today. And uh, I just pray you captivate our attention, our mind, our will, and our emotions as we get into the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, wow. Today we are going to get real with the word. R-E-A-L, real. Uh, read, that means read, examine, apply. And, uh, well, the L is uh, go live it out. <laughs> there should be a G, but I, I changed it to an L. Let's get real. So uh, I, I gave uh, Jerry a list of the, uh, the verses we'll go through, and I'm going to run through the first few real quickly. So feel free to follow along in your Bible. She won't post all of those uh, verses. But before we read, as we read, uh, be asking yourself these questions. What is being revealed about God's nature or his character through, through the word, through the text? What is being revealed about God's will, his design, his direction in general? For, for in general? And then what is God speaking to me, to you, about uh, specifically? All right, so today's focus is in Romans 12, verse 1. And I was telling somebody... Uh, I think last week, the book of Romans is one of my favorites because you can find it all in one place. Uh, but verse 1 starts out like this. I beseech you. This is Paul, right? And the Apostle Paul is saying, I beseech you. This opening statement is a declaration of urgency, of importance. He's about to tell you something very important. It's a pleading this beseech, it's a pleading, it's a begging, and uh, he's, he's doing it with some intensity, okay? And then comes the word, therefore. I beseech you, therefore. And then this, this is a change. So this means there's a transition from a previous text. So it's probably important to call out what this change is from in, in chapter 12. So Paul often divides his messages in two parts. The first part is a doctrinal part. And this is, this is what we believe. And the second is the practical. It's how we live it out. Okay, so if you're reading any of Paul's letters and you're like, oh, this is kind of dry, keep reading because it gets practical, it gets real. All right? I know the Bible can be tough to go through, but, you know, it's, it's part of our daily meal, 
And uh, if your wife packs your lunch, sometimes my wife puts like vitamins in there. I'm like, oh, vitamins or, or vegetables. You know, but you know, you gotta, you gotta get through that part to get to the meat and the, and the dessert. All right, so the doctrinal part. And I'm gonna try and go real quick because the first 11 chapters is focused on just laying the foundation. And this is the, the foundation of faith in Jesus. He's the Messiah. He is the Savior, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That's us. Um, so uh, I'll, get, I'll get through them real quickly, but I'll encourage, I encourage you to go back and read the, the, the entire book, actually. So starting in chapter 1, verse 17 and, and 18, the just will live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Verse 18, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. 2, 6, God's judgment is righteous, and he is the one that's going to render to each person according to their deeds. Okay. 2, 23, to the Jews who were just as guilty as the Gentiles, they dishonored God by breaking his law. 3.23, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Gentiles included. That's us. Chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 6.10-11, we were once dead in sin, but now alive in Christ. Now we are dead to sin and alive to God. That's awesome. 622, we were made free from the slavery to sin. But now we're slaves to God. Nobody wants to be a slave, right? <laughs> but we are a slave to God. We do his bidding. Chapter 7, verse 6, we were made free from the law, and now we serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. Not to say that the letter of the law is, is, a, is abolished forever. I mean, there's still good in the old, but, but we're living from the newness of the spirit. Chapter 8, 1, you guys know this one, right? Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you live according to the flesh and its desires, you are subject to the punishment of the law of sin and death. But if you live and walk by the, the law of the spirit, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled. So that means you, you don't have to try and fulfill the written law if you're allowing God to lead you by the, the spirit, because he will, in fact, help you accomplish that requirement. Okay, 8.15, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again. It didn't come back to you, <laughs> and if it did, don't take it. But the spirit of adoption, let me read that again. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again, but the spirit of adoption, that, or adoption into the family of God, meaning you are joint heirs, joint beneficiaries, with Jesus. We are God's children, joint beneficiaries. I don't know, you guys do uh, annual enrollment for, for health benefits, and medical benefits, and life insurance. There's this part where it's like, I got to put a beneficiary down. You're like, okay, in the state of Texas, automatically it has to be your spouse. So I, I put Megan down. You know, I'm, I'm kidding. Of course I would put Megan down. You would put your spouse down, right? I'm I'm joking here, but the point is we are joint beneficiaries. We are listed with each other to benefit from God's family, his kingdom. All right, chapter 8, 18. And this is, it. This is, this is true. The trials and troubles you're going through now do not compare to the glory that is to come. And we might feel like there's some challenges, and I'll, I'll talk about some challenges later. Um, I promised Megan I wouldn't say anything about COVID, though. I might have to break that promise. Uh, 831, if God is for us, who can be against us? 
Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus. Chapter 9, verse 8. Those who are children of the flesh, that is uh, somebody with a, a carnal mind, an earthly mind, are not children of God. That's a heavy statement. If you read that and really dwell on that, somebody who is of a carnal mind is not a child of God. Only the children of the promise are counted as seed, a child of faith, a child of the Spirit. 925, in order to fulfill the prophecy in Hosea that says, you are not my people, but they shall be called the sons of the living God. He's adopted us who were not considered uh, God's people, God's chosen people, Israel. 930, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness by faith. And the Jews pursuing the law of righteousness have not attained it because they did not seek it by faith, but by works. We, we lucked out. <laughs> As Gentiles, we lucked out. Uh, chapter 10, 1, Paul's desire and his prayer, and should be our prayer too, is for Israel to know the Lord, is for Israel to be saved not continuing by works, but instead by faith. Because Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. So as we pray, as we walk in this Western Christian society, be thinking of Israel. There's a lost Israel that doesn't know Jesus. 1111, to provoke the jealousy of Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. It came to us to provoke Israel, his children. If their failure to accept Jesus as the Messiah resulted richly for us, we benefited, how much better would it be for everyone when they do accept Jesus? And then 1116, the last one here. If the root is holy, that is Abraham, so are the branches, all of Israel, and you and I as Gentiles, as wild branches, we were grafted in among the natural branches, becoming partakers of the root. That's awesome. So that is 11 chapters of Romans uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> but go back and read it. The, there, there are nuggets there. There's doctrinal statements there. The, the things that we believe as Christians, you can just go through Romans, boom, 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 boom. And uh, Paul is setting us up with those first 11 chapters to say something in chapter 12. So back to Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Um, a number of years ago when Megan and I started uh, leading the youth group, we thought, oh, would it, would it be great if we challenged the teens to memorize Romans 12, the entire chapter? Uh, some tried, few accomplished, one really got it, and the prize was uh, an iPad mini. We gave, we gave Carissa uh, an iPad mini, and hopefully she's still using it. Um, we, we learned the lesson there, though. When you, when you start out big, it gets more expensive <laughs> after that. <laughs> so uh, we really ratcheted it down. <laughs> anyway, Romans 12 has a special place for us. Um, so Paul's opening this, this uh, chapter up and the rest of uh, the book, actually 12 through 16, he's, he's opening it up. He's leaning in to this group of believers in Rome and he's, he's like dialing in their attention like a coach does in, in the huddle. Guys, this is how we win in life. This is how we succeed. And then he says, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, Whew. which is your reasonable service. This, this sacrificial system that Israel was living through was um, was over. Jesus ended that sacrificial system. We he couldn't we couldn't earn our way to God, and 
it, we, we couldn't earn our way through by the you know, blood of bulls and goats. But Jesus made that sacrifice, a once and for all sacrifice. And you, you can see that in Hebrews 10.10. 10. Um, now all that was left for us to do was to follow in Jesus' examples, right? To live in such a way, in, in this sacrificial way, um, to, to the Lord. And, and you might be asking, well, what do we sacrifice if not the blood of bulls and goats? The desire to live for yourself. That has got to be the hardest sacrifice in our Western individualistic society. We live for me, 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 me. What can I get? When can I get it? Why isn't it coming fast enough? Right? And Jesus is saying, or Paul is saying, don't live for yourself. Hang that up. And in order to live in this new covenant, this new covenant between man and God, Paul is saying, this new covenant is, is this. I will put my laws on their heart. I will write it on their minds. You, 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 don't, you don't need to memorize the word. You don't need to go through these rote, you know, routine things uh, to earn approval because that sacrifice has already been made. There's a, there's a verse that says, to whom much is given, much is required. There's this uh, reciprocation that happens so in, in our sacrifice. So to the extent that you recognize that God has sacrificed and given to you, the more you will give in return. And then this isn't about your pocketbook, but it's, it's about everything encompassed in your life. The more you see that he has sacrificed for you, the more you will give. So, in order to live under this new covenant, let's read verse 2. And do not be conformed, this is a different version, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the first point there is, don't align your values to the, desi to the desire of the world, or your values or your desires to the world. The word conform there means to shape your behavior or your standards according to a, a pattern. And the word, uh, the world here means a secular society, one that, that, that doesn't value God's standards. So read this another way. Do not behave or try to emulate or, or pattern yourself after the society that does not have God as, as the standard. How often do we you know, get off track just following what we saw on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, that <laughs> one person is honest. <laughs> How often do we really get lost in this, this world and and departing from the standard of God. But now Paul is saying, don't be conformed to the world, but transform, transform your mind. Um, and number two here, the transformation means to change the essential form or nature of who you are. A total change from the inside out. Some of y'all, before you met Jesus, remember that person, remember that young man or woman all right? You are a totally new person, aren't you? <laughs> Some of y'all <laughs> were like, whoo, radically changed, and that's awesome. Um, and, but in this context, Paul is talking about your mind, the way you think or act, your mind. And uh, he's saying, think differently, act differently than before you met him. To see God in, in the nature that he's in, to, to see his kingdom from the right lens and um, to see yourself, how God sees you. That's probably uh, difficult for some of us who are, are very critical of, of yourself. You can't see yourself the way God sees you because you feel like it's, it's a false image. Well, God's saying, renew your mind. You're beautiful. You're lovely. You're loved. You're wanted. You're desired. Yeah. 
Yeah, don't speak those other words against yourself. Um, so if you're struggling with the same attitudes you had before Jesus, those same thoughts, those same feelings of inadequacy, I mean, you're not alone. We all walk through that in one way, shape, or form. It's, it's a journey of, of sanctification. Let me give you some examples of, of, of some things I've, I've heard people say, and then I imagine some people say too. This, this is an example of a mind that needs to be renewed. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. Mm-mm. I can't change. I was born this way. I can't forgive them for what they did to me. I'm not special. I'll always be alone. God can't use me. I don't have anything to offer. None of those statements for a believer in this house or any other house is true. Those are lies you've believed. So how do we renew our mind? According to uh, Paul, what, what he's pleading us to do. He says in Titus uh, 3, 5, that renewing is only by the Holy Spirit who has poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus. So there is no excuse. We, we are born into the family of God. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to renew this mind. And this mind is the only thing that really keeps us from experiencing the life that God has for us. So, it's an intentional surrender. It's a daily commitment. I know some of y'all probably get up and, you know, 4 a.m. and you're, you're working out real, you know, somebody, right? Any, anybody? John. I know John works out. <laughs> yeah. He's disciplined. But I know John also is disciplined in the word and in prayer. And you can see the fruit of it. At, at 71, he's, he's going to beat you on the tennis court. He'll beat you on the track. He's strong in that, and, and he'll, he'll be very strong in prayer and in the word as well, and the, where it really counts. Yeah. So uh, it's a surrender, y'all. The renewing of the mind happens by the Holy Spirit, but it happens through God's word. It happens through prayer. And it happens through fellowship with the believers, those three. So a person who engages with God's word doesn't miss the opportunity for his truth to be revealed by the Holy Spirit. A person who engages in prayer and in conversation with God doesn't miss the opportunities for Holy Spirit to bring encouragement or wisdom or guidance. And a person who engages in fellowship with other believers, they don't miss the opportunities for the Holy Spirit to to sharpen, to to refine, and to reaffirm what you believe. But the inverse is true for those that neglect the word, prayer, and fellowship. All right. Uh, If we continue in this, this transformation, this renewing of the mind, because it, it is ongoing. The result effect of the renewed mind is this, in verse uh, 2, the, the second part, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And to prove something out is to test the genuineness of it through actual use. You can't prove it just through head knowledge. You got to prove it by applying it. So Paul's saying, put it to the test through actual experience in your life. The premise that God's desire for you is truly good, truly pleasing to him, and perfect in every way. Complete in every way. The renewed mind becomes more like Jesus with each passing day. And that person that person that, that becomes renewed, they discover this will of God, that the God's desire for us is what is good for him, is what is perfect for him, is what is acceptable for him. It's, it's not that every experience God has for you is going to be a good one, because there are trials, there are hardships, there are tragedies. 
Um, and, and I don't, you know, I don't want to overlook that. This isn't just the grass is greener and it's always going to be great. No, I'm sorry. But, but the disciple, the transformed mind says, no, God's will, I'm going to walk in it even if it's hard. And as an example related to COVID, <laughs> she read through my notes looking for COVID. <laughs> Some of you may be challenged with the present day um, vaccine mandate, um, with the unemployment that comes with it, the risk of unemployment that comes with it. And that's really hard. Like, I wanna serve God, I wanna do right, I wanna take care of this body you know, but th there, there are forces outside of my control that could jeopardize my income. That's, that's hard, y'all. So my hope is that you would fully be obedient to the Lord. Not comparing what you do to somebody else, okay? Don't, don't look over here and see, well, oh, what's so-and-so doing? Okay, I'm going to do that. No, 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 no. Go to the Lord. He's going to give you direction. And if that means the vaccine, that means the vaccine for you. Don't, don't feel judged by that. And, and on the flip side, for those that don't, don't feel judged for not taking it. Okay, there is freedom. There is freedom in Christ and not judgment. Well, there is judgment, but we're not going to judge you. All right. <clears throat> so how does the transformed person live? How does he serve God in the likeness of his son? This is verse three through five. Okay. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. As God has dealt to each person a measure of faith, for we have many members in one body, but all the members don't have the same function. <clears throat> So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay, it's interesting that Paul is combining humility with the gifts in a church body in the same breath. That's odd. And it might be because it is easy for us as humans uh, to get in our flesh and get in our, you know, in our, in our, in our natural state. And... Uh, and we start seeing other, other people's giftings uh, and maybe our gifting and we elevate ourselves over somebody else's because their gifting isn't as cool as our gifting or important or forefront, right? Uh, Paul's saying, hey, don't think of yourself that high because um, this way of thinking leads to offense. It leads to broken relationships and a divided congregation and ultimately, uh, an ineffective church is when we think about ourselves individually as better than the other. Okay. Uh, but a transformed mind has to have a, a proper sense of humility. And, and that's to see yourself clearly and to see others clearly. And have the awareness that you need each other. We need each other in this body. We do. It's, it's not like the strongest will survive and, you know, hunger games and everybody dies except for one. No, this is, th we all need each other. We're each members that supply to one another. And, and the church is, this church, this church is made up of some amazing people. And yeah, he feels amening himself. <laughs> Megan and I have been here uh, s over 17 years. And, and we're here because there are some amazing people here. And we're all members. All the members are, are here to supply to each other. We're not sitting here waiting for others to serve us. No, we're, we're, we're here to serve. Yeah. All right, let's read verse uh, 6 through 8. Having gifts differing according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. Who, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever your gift is, Paul is saying you should exercise it. Use those gifts. 
like, use it like you are stewarding something that God gave you, all right? Like, um, I know it, it, it sounds like a really simple statement, but there's probably some that feel inadequate, like, ah, I'm just not good enough to serve in church, you know, or my, my gifting isn't good enough. And I would say that's just baloney. If you've got gifts, which you all do, just say, hey, I'm here and I'm willing. I'm here and I'm willing to be used. Put me in, coach. You know, the slow kid. Put me in, coach. That's okay. In the kingdom of God, we all get used. And it's not about the fastest, smartest, most beautiful person, most eloquent person. Put me in, coach. Um, as pastors and leaders, we, we're here to develop you in those gifts and put you to work and put you to use. It's not about, you know, hogging all the glory and hogging the limelight. Um, so if we treat our gifts as, as a, uh, you know, this is an example. We treat it like a, a something we steward. Uh, Danny, Danny's a great young man here. Danny, would you stand up? This is 20 bucks. Danny, here's 20 bucks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> In one year, I'm going to come back and see how you're doing with my 20 bucks. He's going to go buy Bitcoin. <laughs> no. You're going to invest it, right? You're going you're gonna to show me that you did something good with that 20 bucks. You can, you can keep that. Um, because I know he's going to double it, right, next year. Double it. That's what God is doing with the gifts he's given you. I gave you that voice to sing. I gave you that creativity to paint. I gave you the, the, the skills to work with your hands and build something beautiful. What'd you do for me? If all you got is a couple million in the 401k and you're just sitting on the beach, good on you. But the kingdom, there's a God who's looking for more, for, for what he gave you. At the end, we answer for that. We answer to him for that. And, um, and not, you know, not to knock every, you know, want to have a good retirement? Sure. Want to work hard and, and the fruits of your labor? That's great. That's great. But there, there's more in the kingdom. All right. What we're talking about is not material. It's not dollars and cents. What we're talking about when you exercise the gifts that, that Paul is talking about here, it's about lives being changed. It's about hearts being healed and people being introduced to their creator, their savior. You can't put a price tag on that. You can't. We all have gifts that can result in these three things. All right. Moving on to verse 9. 9 through 21. I'm, I'm not going to read 9 through 21. That's a lot. But this section talks about how... Oh, I'm sorry. This section talks about the transformed life, the transformed Christian's relationships with people, both saved and unsaved, and, um, and the attitudes we should have and how we should behave. Whew. Let love be sincere or without hypocrisy. Uh, if you've ever tried to love somebody who doesn't love you back or even like you remotely, you know that it's impossible to love people without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. In our own flesh, what we want to do is we want to tell people off. We just want to tell them off. And we want, you know, in, in Texas, what we do is we say, oh, bless your heart. You know, that's not sincere love. <laughs> it's not. It's hard to love somebody, love a world out there that doesn't love us that doesn't care for us, that doesn't align with our belief system. That's hard. But by the Holy Spirit, you can. <clears throat> the next verse, it's, or in, in the rest of this verse, hate what is evil and cling or hold on to what is good. And this, this pairs with the first statement about being sincere in our love towards our relationship with God. So we have to hate sin. Like, we have to hate it. We have to hate it in our lives so much that we want to, like, get it out of our house. Right. 
Megan has some chickens. I don't, I'm not saying I have chickens. Megan has some chickens. And uh, the past few months, we've noticed things creeping in with the chickens at night. Little critters. Rats. We have rats, y'all. Not in the house, thankfully. But we have rats because we have chickens. You know what? Megan hates those rats. And she's doing whatever it takes to get those rats away from the chickens or the chickens' food. She hates it. I mean, she spends so much on Amazon buying things to get rid of these rats. How hard are we trying to get sin out of our lives? If you hate it, you're going to do whatever it takes to get it out. you gotta, you got to make that that intentional turn away from it as well. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I hate sin. But there's a turning away from it. And when there's an opportunity, you see that rat again, Megan's like, get the BB gun. You know, <laughs> when, you, when you see that sin cre- creeping up on you, it's like, nope, not today. Not today. Next one, um, verse 10. Yes. Treat the church like family. This is brotherly love. Treat the church like family. Consider others better than yourself, more important than yourself. Um, If you've been raised in a really hard lifestyle, like a dog eat dog kind of highlight, uh, a a dog eat dog kind of lifestyle, or, you know, I got to get mine first kind of lifestyle, whew. This is difficult to swallow. This is like, I got to put somebody else's needs before mine? Really? Yes, really. We do. We do. Look around you. I mean, there are people in this church and in our community that have needs. They have needs. They have real needs. They, they don't have meals. They don't have clothing. They don't have transportation. They don't have jobs. We need to put their needs ahead of our own. If you're comfortable, right? Or even if you're not, if, even if you're uncomfortable right now and you're going through it, you got to put their needs first. That's hard. The next one, um, don't be lazy in serving God. Do it with diligence. Do it with diligence. Megan and I, we have two kids, Charlie and Isaac, and I won't say who's who in this situation, but whenever... Megan says, hey, somebody please take the trash out. There is one child who's like, I'll do it. And they get it done, and they love to do it. And the other one's like, yeah, I'll do it. 15 minutes later, yeah, uh, you know. God's like, no, don't be lazy serving me. Get it done. Be excited to serve God. Be excited to serve people with the gifts that God gave you. Don't be lazy. The next one, be joyful because your hope is in Christ. Yeah, be joyful. Your hope is in Christ. It's not in the paycheck. It's not in the retirement fund. It's not in the government. It's not in your spouse. Your joy is from the Lord. And when trials come, those other things, they're not going to help you. The Lord will. Yeah. So when trials come, be patient because he's working, and he's going to come through because we know he's faithful. Go to him for wisdom. Go to him for, for guidance, for strength, for encouragement. Yeah. Um, that's, boy, I only got to 12. Okay, I, w- I won't make it through the next nine verses, but um, because there's, there, okay, the, the rest of chapter 12 is through verse 21. So you guys go read Romans. This is homework for y'all. Read the whole book of Romans because uh, there's some vital instruction in there for the believer, okay? And uh, so I encourage you to read it and uh, you know, examine it, apply it to your life. Uh, the next chapter is really interesting, chapter 13. It talks about submitting to the government's authority. Whew. Y'all love that, right? Yeah, I know, I know. That's hard. You'll have fun with that one. But, like, we, like 
honestly. <laughs> submitting to authority is hard. Submitting to government authority is even harder. So um, do that one. Uh, so let me close with this thought. This thought. It's from 2 Corinthians 5.19. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting our trespasses against us. And then he's entrusting us with that message of reconciliation. So uh, today I know, I, I think there's three groups of people here at least. I believe some need to be reconciled to God. They need their lives reconciled. And you're, you're living below the standard that God has for you. And in, in some ways, you're conformed to the world, and you're not conformed to his word and his, his righteousness. You need to be renewed. Secondly, like, like the Apostle Paul on the road uh, of Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus. I believe there are some here today that um, you have a call of God on your life. You have a call to preach. You have a call to, to evangelize. And it was a gift that was given to you, and, you, and you're avoiding it. You've set it aside. Um, or maybe you're just still considering it. You're weighing your options, right? Perhaps today is the day to revisit that call. You know, this world is, is changing rapidly and crazy. It's crazy out there. Uh, so it needs Jesus. It needs people to, to preach the word. Who's, how are they going to hear if it's not preached? Um, and then finally, there's a group here. You know, you, you, we read the characteristics in, in Romans 9 through 21, and you've fallen short in some area. It's like all of us. <laughs> We've fallen short, and we just need God to build us up. You know? Would you all stand here as, as we close? If you said, yeah, that's me, I'm in one of those groups, I, I need my life reconciled to God, or I've been called to preach, but I've been ignoring him, I've been avoiding it, I've got gifts, but I, I'm just afraid to use them. If that's you, or, or you're in the third group, like everybody else is, who's honest with themselves, like, who's not walking Christ-like, according to Romans 9, uh, 12 through 21, or I'm sorry, Romans 12, 9 through 21. I just want to pray for you. So, so just close your eyes, put your hand on your heart. If that's you, if that's you, I want to pray. God, help us. Help us to walk in a way worthy of your calling, to present this life that we have in a real meaningful, sacrificial way, that we would put aside any distractions, any lies that have ensnared us, that have trapped us, um, that are preventing us from bringing you glory here on earth. And for those who have walked um, apart from you, but today they're seeking salvation and reconciliation, God, I, I pray that you meet them right where they're at, that you provide um, your, your forgiveness, your grace. Holy Spirit, would you start a work of renewing their mind? So your thoughts would be their thoughts. Those who have been called to preach the gospel, God, I, I pray that you give them courage to use that gift, to put their trust in you. And that, and that might mean changing a lot of things, going out on a limb by faith, but that you would provide the means for them to do it and the avenues to share the good news. And, uh, God, that you would bring support to them, that, they, that the support they need to be effective in, the, in that ministry. And for the rest of us, whose desire is just to please you in our relationships, with our attitudes, don't let our hearts be hardened when we hear your word. Holy Spirit, would you keep prodding us, keep impressing on us and leading us to live a life worthy of your calling. We thank you so much, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Hope you guys were blessed. And there's so, so much richness in the, in the book of Romans, and I encourage you to go back and read it. Um, 
And if anybody would like prayer, welcome you to come up. We'd pray for you. If not, uh, have a great day. Have a great week.